Dana Lewis got tired of devoting so much of her mental energy to managing her diabetes and invented the open-source artificial pancreas system. Jamie and Ben Haywood lived through their brother Stephen's experience of healthcare and his battle with ALS and started Patients Like Me, the world's largest grassroots online patient community. Riley Ennis experienced the dysfunction of the health system as his sister dealt with a serious heart condition and founded Freenome, a company that's focused on diagnosing cancer earlier via blood tests. What all these people share in common is that they didn't approach healthcare. Healthcare approached them and disrupted their lives. And they realized that there was something they could do to make it better. But how does that desire to change things culminate in those changes actually coming to pass? Hello and welcome to Data Point, the podcast where we focus on all the ways that data and analytics are driving innovation in healthcare today. I'm your host, Greg Matthews, and our guest this week is Jan Oldenburg of Participatory Healthcare Consulting. Jan has been working at the intersection of healthcare, technology, and innovation for a long time, with an increasing focus on how to leverage technology and innovation, not as an end, but as the means of enabling more impactful participation and connection between the various stakeholders in the ecosystem, especially the patient and the clinician. She's worked both as an independent consultant and advisor and as a senior executive at organizations like Kaiser Permanente, Aetna, and Price Waterhouse. But wherever she's sitting, she's a big proponent of working from, as David Brooks called it in the New York Times, the edge of inside. Jan is a fellow of the Healthcare Information and Management Systems Society, or HIMSS, and is a member of the board of directors of the Society for Participatory Medicine. And if you consult our show notes, you'll find a discount code for the series of books that Jan produced with HIMSS on participatory medicine and patient engagement. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Jan Oldenburg. Jan, thanks so much for being with us on Data Point today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited about this opportunity. Outstanding. Well, I have uh, admired your work for a long time, uh, and I think as a as a leading voice in health innovation and the evolution of the way that we that we practice healthcare, I'm really excited to introduce some of your latest thinking and your latest work to our listeners. Um, but before we do that, I would love for people to get a little bit of a sense of who you are. Um, can you give us a little bit of background into how you came to be doing the work that you're doing today? Yes, I can. Uh, although it's not a very straightforward story. I, I, <laughs> the interesting I, ones I, never are. <laughs> I often talk about my checkered past because I actually started out to uh, become a professor of English. That was my intention. And got partway through and said, oh, man, I don't think this is the right uh, approach for me. I'm going to be bored. Uh, so I spent some time doing technical writing, which was uh, an evolution. The, the very first project I had was to document the accounts receivable system at Northern Telecom in Minneapolis. And I did 27 interviews, and then I had to go home and have my CPA father teach me what a debit and a credit were. <laughs> I can only imagine. Wow, what a, what a thrown into the deep end experience. Exactly. But one of the things that that experience gave me was um, an understanding of the license it gives you to say, help me understand that. Tell me more about that. Mm which has actually been hugely useful all along the way. And in any case, I moved from technical writing to uh, creating an information center back in the early days of PCs and end user computing, uh, and then had the opportunity to become a, from there a director in IT. Um, and I was mostly on the projects that required a different kind of thinking than our standard, the people who grew up in the standard systems environment. Um, mm. One of them, for example, was providing a set of reports on claims data that our uh, employer clients could run themselves rather than with parameters, rather than uh, just what we decided to feed them. Mm hmm. Um, and then I went from there actually into, I had the marvelous opportunity at Health Partners in Minneapolis to figure out how to 
win the hearts and minds of their contracted providers using technology, which was a venture into using the internet, creating uh, self-service tools, um, making it more of a public utility than a private uh, set of capabilities. And that's where I actually had my first opportunities to do consumer internet capabilities mm. as well. Boy, and that was a whole new ball game back then. Oh, totally. And, and really fun to be on the, the leading edge of that. And uh, that led to my first, uh, forming my first consulting company, which was focused on helping organizations figure out how to use technology and specifically internet technology at the intersection of marketing and business process. And then I moved into, I moved out to California, had the opportunity to join Kaiser to do the first rollout of uh, its uh, patient facing capabilities um, as they implemented Epic, uh, which was absolutely marvelous. And between health partners and Kaiser, I got a deep understanding of the power of integrated care delivery and the way that the levers work and align. Mm -hmm. um, then I went to Aetna for a period while I, um, as they were doing their ACO uh, development and had the opportunity to help them figure out how to win both the provider hearts and the consumer hearts um, using technology. Um, then back to consulting first with EOI and now on my own. So there's a thread here, Jan, that I see that you seem to land in these organizations just as sea changes are happening. Am I reading that right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's, uh, I have often called myself an entrepreneur. I yeah. That I'm good at helping organizations make uh, dramatic changes from the inside in entrepreneurial settings. I'd like to explore that a little bit because, first of all, the places that you've worked, you know, the introduction of, um, you know, electronic data transfers and e-commerce within healthcare, uh, the advent of the, you know, the online, electro the, the electronic medical record, like, these are all things that we sort of take for granted today and, and uh, agree are generally good and part of sort of the foundation of healthcare. But when they were launched, they were massively disruptive. Uh, I guess, can you help us understand a little bit about how your work has helped to manage that, how you managed to integrate these tremendously disruptive things into you know, these large organizations? Yes, and it may be a signal of my success or relative lack of it that I now work for myself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, David Brooks had a great editorial a couple of years ago about being on the edge of inside, um, about mm -hmm. working within organizations, but with a bit of an outsider's mindset. And I felt as if that was a great depiction of how I often work inside of organizations which is, um, you know, working within the power and, and the history of an organization to help it make some of these significant changes in ways that, on the one hand, yes, they do threaten established practice and belief, but on the other hand, can be um, highlighted as a part of the uh, the process, the growth, the natural evolution of the organization. Mm -hmm. And as you have experienced that, are are there are there characteristics of the organizations that are able to make these kind of transitions that you feel have enabled them to be more successful than others? Because certainly, you know, the kind of changes that you've been involved with, a lot of organizations have not been able to make the jump. They've fallen by the wayside. What, what is it about these organizations that have experienced this successfully that you think enables them to do that? You know, I think the concept of a learning organization is probably huge here. Mm -hmm. That generally organizations that are able to succeed at this have a bit of a learner's mindset, uh, at least in corners, at least in some leaders. And so they're thinking about always how do we keep growing? How do we introduce change? How do we 
make ourselves different. And so they're open to the voices uh, inside that are identifying ways and means or challenging the established uh, approaches. Uh, not necessarily because they're always ready to embrace them, but at least because they recognize the value of what I'll call for the moment the loyal opposition. Ah, uh, yes. Now, and, and that is interesting. And it's such a, um, it's a sophisticated and more nuanced way, I guess maybe a more mature way for an organization to be able to behave, you know, to recognize that there's not just one point of view on the issue. <laughs> Yeah, it requires big, open, confident in their own space leaders to be able to do this. Yeah, yeah, it really does, and that is um, b being able to identify those people and to enable them, help them to be in a position to flourish. Uh, I would imagine is has been an important part of your work. Absolutely, um, mm. the best advice I ever I think got from uh, one of my managers, and it was a VP at Northwestern National Life. Um, and at the time it made me really angry and yet I have come to see it as the best guidance I ever received. And, you know, at some point I was in his office, I was complaining about something, um, what it, it was, was lost in the mists of time, but <laughs> he said to me, you know, Dan, dissatisfaction is the seed of motivation. Wow. That's pretty <laughs> profound. <laughs> well, it is. And at the time, I thought it was an excuse for him not to do anything, <laughs> um, which it possibly might have been. But what what I have come to take from it is the learning that I need to lead from wherever I stand mm, and that yeah. I can't keep waiting around for everybody else to change or for the environment to change or the laws to change or whatever, that it's my responsibility to take action in the moment within whatever scope I have and maybe pushing the boundaries of that scope. That actually provides us, I think, with an excellent jumping off point as we, uh, when we come back from our break. We're going to take a quick break here, but we're going to be right back on Data Point with Jan Oldenburg. Today's show is brought to you by Blue Spire, a full-service digital marketing agency focused on complex and highly regulated industries of healthcare, senior living, and financial services. Rapid changes in the healthcare industry are causing consumers to seek out trusted advice, demand more transparency and access to information and content. With over 30 years of healthcare experience, Blue Spire knows how to help you reach, communicate with, and gain trust from these consumers. We help you engage with the right content at every touch point, from the first symptom search to appointment scheduling through care management. Visit us at bluespiremarketing.com to learn how we can help you deliver relevant, engaging content through ever-changing touch points that matter. And we are back. You're listening to Data Point. I'm your host, Greg Matthews, and we are here talking with Jan Oldenburg today. Jan, when we went into the break, you were talking about the ability, the importance uh, of being able to lead from where you are, of being willing to take risks and make change within the context that you have. And one of the things that has struck me about your background as, as the, you introduced yourself is that you've had experience in introducing disruptive and radical technology and process and business frameworks into the companies you've worked with. But one of the things that I feel has characterized your work most recently is this real focus on how those things impact the people who are most closely involved, the patients, the physicians. Can you talk to us a little bit about your transition into really thinking about you know, how to engage those key constituencies in the process of evolving healthcare? Yeah, that's a great topic. Um, and I think it probably started as I was doing the work first at Health Partners with the uh, physicians in their contracted network, and next at Kaiser, where I was really 
seeing the direct impact of the access to personal health data, access mm. to contextualized education on the lives of the people who were Kaiser members. Yeah. And, and I start to see this, um, the, the real power of the virtual, the virtuous circle or cycle. Okay. Uh, you know, people get engaged in part when they're encouraged to be engaged by their doctors. Mm-hmm. And they, you know, and, and I think we're still in a mode where to some degree it helps people to know they have permission to be engaged, that it's not yeah. be something that leads to frustration or um, worse treatment on the part of their docs. I hate that, but I think it's true. Right. Uh, and and then docs and staff get engaged, A, when they when it's a part of the culture they work in, and B, when they see that their patients are pushing them, their patients want this, that their patients are responsive. Mm. That they're, you know, we're in a world right now where healthcare is behind the rest of the industries that consumers interact with around their technology. Right. And consumers are saying, come on, healthcare, <laughs> give me the kinds of tools that I've got in the rest of my life. So what you're saying is that as patients have access to these new tools to, you know, actively manage their health, which, you know, certainly seems to be what we in the health system want them to do, they actually are in turn putting pressure on the system to enable them to do that more effectively. Am I reading that right? Exactly. Uh, and then that in turn uh, forces health systems of, you know, health systems including uh, payers, including mm. pharma, including downstream things to really think through how are they going to make those changes. Um, I, I also would say that we have given lip service for a long time to being patient centered. Yeah. But often our processes and policies and technology are much more focused on the convenience of the people inside than convenience for patients. And so one of the things I try to do with using patient stories to illustrate why and how we still need to change is that it brings that lens of the suffering we inadvertently inflict on the people we are actually trying to serve. So let's uh, let's unpack that a little bit. Patient stories sounds, you know, on the surface of it, kind of nice and fluffy and probably good for some PR. What kind of real change do you see being affected as a result of these patient stories becoming more visible and, and proliferating? Uh, that's a great question. And of course, this goes back to our earlier discussion about the relative levels of responsiveness of institutions. Mm -hmm leadership. Uh, but uh, quite honestly, I think, uh, you know, it's a lens that we didn't, we formerly just didn't even think about. We didn't consider the relationship between, for example, satisfaction ratings and how much respect we were mm. given patients and caregivers. We didn't think about uh, whether people were completing clinical trials and consider what their experience of the clinical trials was and how engaged they were in either design or in understanding outcomes or understanding the why of what they were being asked to do. Um, and I think we're, we're moving in society, or at least I like to think we're moving to a more collaborative approach in many different ways. There's a demo democratization of information and data and in healthcare, embracing that means really bringing patients, caregivers into the process of making change. It sounds like healthcare organizations committing the classic blunder, um, not uh, never getting into a land war in Asia, uh, but uh, in this case, sorry, Princess Bride reference. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> that, that was that was not in my notes, Jan. I I apologize. <laughs> Uh, the classic blunder of assuming that your 
patient stakeholder values the same things that you do. Uh, you know, efficiency, safety, you're not thinking about, do I treat them with respect as something that they value? Um, or is, is, are we valuing their efficiency rather than only ours? <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. So you, I, I read an interview recently in which you said something that I felt, felt was kind of provocative. Um, there was a discussion around the use of the term patient engagement, uh, which is certainly something that has been batted around uh, the the healthcare industry for many years. You were referring to it less as patient engagement and more about personal health engagement. Can you tell me about what the difference between those things is? Yes, absolutely. Um, and, you know, I, in some sense, I'm biting the hand that feeds me in this respect because I'm clearly associated with patient engagement. Mm. Uh, but I have come to worry about the term because in healthcare, we tend to use it as if we can engage the patients and caregivers, as if it's something we can do to them. Right. When in fact, engagement is all about intrinsic motivations. We can be engaging and we can create a mode, a system technology that makes it easier and more convenient for patients and consumers to interact with us. But it's their choice how yep. and when and where they engage. You know, it sounds a little bit like um, what Jane Saracen Khan is calling uh, health citizenship mm -hmm. um, in, her, in her new book. Um, that ability, but also responsibility uh, for a patient to be, you know, to have access to the right information, to have access to uh, the the provision of care in the right mode uh, at the right time. Um, so it makes a tremendous amount of sense. Um, I, I wanted to close out here and just talking about books. You've recently been working through a series of books with hymns uh, on participatory health. Can you tell us a little bit about what brought that about and where your your focus is there? Absolutely. Um this actually came out of my participation on what was originally the e-patients committee at National Hymns and has become the Connecting Health Committee. Uh, and I was on it for probably six years and co-chaired for two. And it was honestly Mary Griskowitz, who's now at Cigna, but was leading the staff person responsible for that, who basically suggested at some point that maybe what the movement needed was a book that really framed what the advantages and benefits of uh, this approach were. And I, um, I was not actually on the committee at the time. Um, I was just leaving Kaiser and uh, the woman who was our, uh, MD, medical director for kp.org, was chairing the committee, Kate Christensen, mm -hmm. and Kate said to me, hey, you want to you wanna edit a book on uh, participatory health and patient engagement? I'm like, yes, this is my English major roots come to fruition. <laughs> <laughs> um, and of course, the only catch was that we had to figure out how to do it in six months so it could hit the next publishing cycle. Oh, uh, my. But... It was an absolutely marvelous opportunity for me to engage other people in that process, to bring together the wisdom that we had at the time. And honestly, it still sells remarkably well for something published in 2013. Hmm. Uh, that, um, about what's the, what's the basis, the evidence basis that says that engaging consumers in their health using digital tools actually makes a difference. Yeah. And that man in a, in an industry that is driven by the documentation of evidence is such an important thing to be able to do to make a case for this, 
you know, different way of doing things. And for, for my uh, listeners who are not healthcare wonks, which includes at least my parents, hi, mom and dad, uh, <laughs> HIMSS is the Healthcare Information and Management System Society, w- which when you think about it, very technology driven, very kind of back end focused historically. So it's kind of remarkable um, that that was the vehicle that that there, there was this emphasis on participatory medicine there. I think that is it's really powerful uh, coming through that organization. So it sounds like an amazing experience. It, it not only was an amazing experience, but I will just say that it was also part of another one of those places of shifting things from the inside. As I, I like to think that mm. the members of that committee um, helped move hymns. Uh, into a different framing about the importance of patients and consumers. Um, Anyway, after doing that, one of the next steps was, you know, we told this story originally really for the providers and Mm -hmm. um, help them think about it differently. But, you know, honestly, there needs to be a story more from the perspective of patients and caregivers and what they value uh, reflected in it. So that was the genesis then for the second book, Participatory Healthcare, uh, where we really tried to look at what it is that patients need. If you think about the various uh, steps in a, a, a patient journey, a consumer to patient journey, and how technology could enable those things at each point. But also, uh, honestly, one of the lessons for me in writing that book was about how many people take the experience, um, sometimes bad, sometimes good, Mm. sometimes mixed, of having a health incident or having a loved one have a significant health incident and turn that into mission and focus. Um, And honestly, that's the genesis of um, a book that ePatient Dave, Dave DeBroncart and I, are just beginning to work on, which is about looking at the individuals who started out as, you know, ordinary folks pursuing some career, had a a maybe one time, maybe a longer term engagement with the health system where they said, you know, this isn't working. Either they mm. can't come up with a diagnosis, they don't have a treatment or the process isn't working and made um, a change, an invention, a public policy approach that really significant changed the course of medical care. I love that. And I think it is so, I, I find it so inspiring, sort of the the transitions and in terms of your own focus and how they've really come back to the heart of the matter, which is number one, Healthcare is about the health of the individual, not the, you know, quote unquote, health or performance of the system. And secondly, that those people who are impacted by the system have mechanisms today for actually changing the system. Um, I cannot wait for that book to come out. Thank you. I'll (laughs) post it for sure. (laughs) Excellent. Jan, I am going to be posting links to the books and to your website in our, uh, in our show notes. I just want to thank you so much for being a guest today. And I think probably really triggering some of our listeners to, to think about, Hmm, what are the things that I could be doing from where I am inside my organization? Because I think that is the kind of change that is really going to move the needle when there are more of us and more of us and more of us that are all pulling in that same direction. So Jan Oldenburg, thank you so much for being here. Truly my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks so much for listening to the Data Point podcast. If you like what you've heard, please do rate, review, and share it with your social network. It means a lot. And if you have ideas for show topics or guests, please email them to me at greg at healthquant.health or send a direct message to at Chai Moose on Twitter. That's C-H-I-M-O-O-S-E on Twitter. For more information about this show or any of the terrific healthcare podcasts in the Touchpoint Media Network, check them out at touchpoint.health. See you next time. This has been a Touchpoint Media production. 
To learn more about this show and others like it, please visit us online at touchpoint.health.